The Curious Case of Benjamin Button, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden. The Curious Case of Benjamin Button by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Part 2. Chapter 5. In 1880, Benjamin Button was twenty years old, and he signalized his birthday by going to work for his father in Roger Button & Company Wholesale Hardware. It was in that same year that he began going out socially. That is, his father insisted on taking him to several fashionable dances. Roger Button was now fifty, and he and his son were more and more companionable. In fact, since Benjamin had ceased to dye his hair, which was still grayish, they appeared about the same age, and could have passed for brothers. One night in August they got into the Phaeton, attired in their full-dress suits, and drove out to a dance at the Shevlin's country house, situated just outside of Baltimore. It was a gorgeous evening. A full moon drenched the road to the lusterless color of platinum, and late-blooming harvest flowers breathed into the motionless air aromas that were like low, half-heard laughter. The open country, carpeted for rods around with bright wheat, was translucent as in the day. It was almost impossible not to be affected by the sheer beauty of the sky. Almost. "'There's a great future in the dry-goods business,' Roger Button was saying. He was not a spiritual man. His aesthetic sense was rudimentary. "'Old fellows like me can't learn new tricks,' he observed profoundly. It's you youngsters, with energy and vitality, that have the great future before you. Far up the road the lights of the Shevlin's country house drifted into view, and presently there was a sighing sound that crept persistently toward them. It might have been the fine plaint of violins, or the rustle of the silver wheat under the moon. They pulled up behind a handsome brougham whose passengers were disembarking at the door. A lady got out, then an elderly gentleman, then another young lady, beautiful as sin. Benjamin started. An almost chemical change seemed to dissolve and recompose the very elements of his body. A rigor passed over him, blood rose into his cheeks, his forehead, and there was a steady thumping in his ears. It was first love. The girl was slender and frail, with hair that was ashen under the moon and honey-colored under the sputtering gas-lamps of the porch. Over her shoulders was thrown a Spanish mantilla of softest yellow, butterflied in black. Her feet were glittering buttons at the hem of her bustled dress. Roger Button leaned over to his son. That, he said, is young Hildegard Moncrief, the daughter of General Moncrief. Benjamin nodded coldly. Pretty little thing, he said indifferently. But when the negro boy had led the buggy away, he added, Dad, you might introduce me to her. They approached a group of which Miss Moncrief was the center. Reared in the old tradition, she courtesied low before Benjamin. Yes, he might have a dance. He thanked her and walked away, staggered away. The interval until the time for his turn should arrive dragged itself out interminably. He stood close to the wall, silent, inscrutable, watching with murderous eyes the young bloods of Baltimore as they eddied around Hildegard Moncrief, passionate admiration in their faces. How obnoxious they seemed to Benjamin! How intolerably rosy! Their curling brown whiskers aroused in him a feeling equivalent to indigestion. But when his own time came, and he drifted with her out upon the changing floor to the music of the latest waltz from Paris, his jealousies and anxieties melted from him like a mantle of snow. Blind with enchantment, he felt that life was just beginning. "'You and your brother got here just as we did, didn't you?' asked Hildegard, looking up at him with eyes that were like bright blue enamel. Benjamin hesitated. If she took him for his father's brother, would it be best to enlighten her? He remembered his experience at Yale, so he decided against it. It would be rude to contradict a lady. It would be criminal to mar this exquisite occasion with the grotesque story of his origin. Later, perhaps. So he nodded, smiled, listened, was happy. "'I like men of your age,' Hildegard told him. "'Young boys are so idiotic. They tell me how much champagne they drink at college and how much money they lose playing cards. Men of your age know how to appreciate women.' 
Benjamin felt himself on the verge of a proposal. With an effort he choked back the impulse. "'You're just the romantic age,' she continued. Fifty. Twenty-five is too worldly-wise. Thirty is apt to be pale from overwork. Forty is the age of long stories that take a whole cigar to tell. Sixty is—oh, sixty is too near seventy. But fifty is the mellow age. I love fifty. Fifty seemed to Benjamin a glorious age. He longed passionately to be fifty. "'I've always said,' went on Hildegard, "'that I'd rather marry a man of fifty and be taken care of "'than marry a man of thirty and take care of him.' For Benjamin, the rest of the evening was bathed in a honey-colored mist. Hildegard gave him two more dances, and they discovered that they were marvelously in accord on all the questions of the day. She was to go driving with him on the following Sunday, and then they would discuss all these questions further. Going home in the Phaeton just before the crack of dawn, when the first bees were humming and the fading moon glimmered in the cool dew, Benjamin knew vaguely that his father was discussing wholesale hardware. "'And what do you think should merit our biggest attention after hammers and nails?' the elder Button was saying. "'Love,' replied Benjamin, absent-mindedly. "'Lugs,' exclaimed Roger Button. "'Why, I've just covered the question of lugs.' Benjamin regarded him with dazed eyes, just as the eastern sky was suddenly cracked with light, and an oriole yawned piercingly in the quickening trees. CHAPTER Six. When, six months later, the engagement of Miss Hildegard Moncrief to Mr. Benjamin Button was made known, I say made known, for General Moncrief declared he would rather fall upon his sword than announce it, the excitement in Baltimore society reached a feverish pitch. The almost forgotten story of Benjamin's birth was remembered and sent out upon the winds of scandal in picaresque and incredible forms. It was said that Benjamin was really the father of Roger Button, that he was his brother who had been in prison for forty years, that he was John Wilkes Booth in disguise, and finally that he had two small conical horns sprouting from his head. The Sunday supplements of the New York papers played up the case with fascinating sketches which showed the head of Benjamin Button attached to a fish, to a snake, and finally to a body of solid brass. He became known journalistically as the Mystery Man of Maryland, but the true story, as is usually the case, had a very small circulation. However, everyone agreed with General Moncrief that it was criminal for a lovely girl who could have married any beau in Baltimore to throw herself into the arms of a man who was assuredly fifty. In vain, Mr. Roger Button published his son's birth certificate in large type in the Baltimore blaze. No one believed it. You had only to look at Benjamin and see. On the part of the two people most concerned, there was no wavering. So many of the stories about her fiancé were false that Hildegard refused stubbornly to believe even the true one. In vain, General Moncrief pointed out to her the high mortality among men of fifty, or at least among men who looked fifty. In vain, he told her of the instability of the wholesale hardware business. Hildegard had chosen to marry for mellowness, and marry she did. CHAPTER Seven. In one particular, at least, the friends of Hildegard Moncrief were mistaken. The wholesale hardware business prospered amazingly. In the fifteen years between Benjamin Button's marriage in 1880 and his father's retirement in 1895, the family fortune was doubled, and this was due largely to the younger member of the firm. Needless to say, Baltimore eventually received the couple to its bosom. Even old General Moncrief became reconciled to his son-in-law when Benjamin gave him the money to bring out his History of the Civil War in twenty volumes, which had been refused by nine prominent publishers. In Benjamin himself, fifteen years had wrought many changes. It seemed to him that the blood flowed with new vigor through his veins. It began to be a pleasure to rise in the morning, to walk with an active step along the busy, sunny street, to work untiringly with his shipments of hammers and his cargoes of nails. It was in 1890 that he executed his famous business coup. He brought up the suggestion that all nails used in nailing up the boxes in which nails are shipped are the property of the shippee, a proposal which became a statute, 
was approved by Chief Justice Fossile and saved Roger Button and Company wholesale hardware more than six hundred nails every year. In addition, Benjamin discovered that he was becoming more and more attracted by the gay side of life. It was typical of his growing enthusiasm for pleasure that he was the first man in the city of Baltimore to own and run an automobile. Meeting him on the street, his contemporaries would stare enviously at the picture he made of health and vitality. He seems to grow younger every year, they would remark. And if old Roger Button, now sixty-five years old, had failed at first to give a proper welcome to his son, he atoned at last by bestowing on him what amounted to adulation. And here we come to an unpleasant subject which it will be well to pass over as quickly as possible. There was only one thing that worried Benjamin Button. His wife had ceased to attract him. At that time Hildegard was a woman of thirty-five, with a son, Roscoe, fourteen years old. In the early days of their marriage, Benjamin had worshipped her. But as the years passed, her honey-colored hair became an unexciting brown. The blue enamel of her eyes assumed the aspect of cheap crockery. Moreover, and most of all, she had become too settled in her ways, too placid, too content, too anemic in her excitements, and too sober in her taste. As a bride, it had been she who had dragged Benjamin to dances and dinners. Now conditions were reversed. She went out socially with him, but without enthusiasm, devoured already by that eternal inertia which comes to live with each of us one day and stays with us to the end. Benjamin's discontent waxed stronger. At the outbreak of the Spanish-American War in 1898, his home had for him so little charm that he decided to join the army. With his business influence, he obtained a commission as captain, and proved so adaptable to the work that he was made a major, and finally a lieutenant colonel, just in time to participate in the celebrated charge up San Juan Hill. He was slightly wounded, and received a medal. Benjamin had become so attached to the activity and excitement of army life that he regretted to give it up, but his business required attention, so he resigned his commission and came home. He was met at the station by a brass band and escorted to his house. Chapter 8 Hildegard, waving a large silk flag, greeted him on the porch, and even as he kissed her he felt with a sinking of the heart that these three years had taken their toll. She was a woman of forty now, with a faint skirmish line of gray hairs in her head. The sight depressed him. Up in his room he saw his reflection in the familiar mirror. He went closer and examined his own face with anxiety, comparing it, after a moment, with a photograph of himself in uniform taken just before the war. "'Good Lord!' he said aloud. The process was continuing. There was no doubt of it. He looked now like a man of thirty. Instead of being delighted, he was uneasy. He was growing younger. He had hitherto hoped that once he reached a bodily age equivalent to his age in years, the grotesque phenomenon which had marked his birth would cease to function. He shuddered. His destiny seemed to him awful, incredible. When he came downstairs, Hildegard was waiting for him. She appeared annoyed, and he wondered if she had at last discovered that there was something amiss. It was with an effort to relieve the tension between them that he broached the matter at dinner in what he considered a delicate way. Well, he remarked lightly, everybody says I look younger than ever. Hildegard regarded him with scorn. She sniffed. Do you think it's anything to boast about? I'm not boasting, he asserted uncomfortably. She sniffed again. The idea, she said, and, after a moment, I should think you'd have enough pride to stop it. How can I? he demanded. I'm not going to argue with you, she retorted. But there's a right way of doing things, and a wrong way. If you've made up your mind to be different from everybody else, I don't suppose I can stop you, but I really don't think it's very considerate. But, Hildegard, I can't help it. You can, too. You're simply stubborn. You think you don't want to be like anyone else. You have always been that way, and you always will be. But just think how it would be if everyone else looked at things as you do. What would the world be like? As this was an inane and unanswerable argument, Benjamin made no reply, and from that time on a chasm began to widen between them. 
he wondered what possible fascination she had ever exercised over him. To add to the breach, he found, as the new sentry gathered headway, that his thirst for gaiety grew stronger. Never a party of any kind in the city of Baltimore, but he was there, dancing with the prettiest of the young married women, chatting with the most popular of the debutantes, and finding their company charming, while his wife, a dowager of evil omen, sat among the chaperones, now in haughty disapproval, and now following him with solemn, puzzled, and reproachful eyes. Look, people would remark, what a pity, a young fellow that age tied to a woman of forty-five. He must be twenty years younger than his wife. They had forgotten, as people inevitably forget, that back in 1880 their mamas and papas had also remarked about this same ill-matched pair. Benjamin's growing unhappiness at home was compensated for by his many new interests. He took up golf and made a great success of it. He went in for dancing. In 1906 he was an expert at the Boston, and in 1908 he was considered proficient at the Maxis, while in 1909 his castle walk was the envy of every young man in town. His social activities, of course, interfered to some extent with his business, but then he had worked hard at wholesale hardware for twenty-five years, and felt that he could soon hand it on to his son, Roscoe, who had recently graduated from Harvard. He and his son were, in fact, often mistaken for each other. This pleased Benjamin. He soon forgot the insidious fear which had come over him on his return from the Spanish-American War, and grew to take a naive pleasure in his appearance. There was only one fly in the delicious ointment. He hated to appear in public with his wife. Hildegard was almost fifty, and the sight of her made him feel absurd. CHAPTER Nine, One September day in 1910, a few years after Roger Button and Company, Wholesale Hardware, had been handed over to young Roscoe Button, a man, apparently about twenty years old, entered himself as a freshman at Harvard University in Cambridge. He did not make the mistake of announcing that he would never see fifty again, nor did he mention the fact that his son had been graduated from the same institution ten years before. He was admitted, and almost immediately attained a prominent position in the class, partly because he seemed a little older than the other freshmen, whose average age was about eighteen. But his success was largely due to the fact that in the football game with Yale he played so brilliantly, with so much dash, and with such a cold, remorseless anger, that he scored seven touchdowns and fourteen field goals for Harvard and caused one entire eleven of Yale men to be carried singly from the field, unconscious. He was the most celebrated man in college. Strange to say, in his third or junior year, he was scarcely able to make the team. The coaches said that he had lost weight, and it seemed to the more observant among them that he was not quite as tall as before. He made no touchdowns. Indeed, he was retained on the team, chiefly in hope that his enormous reputation would bring terror and disorganization to the Yale team. In his senior year, he did not make the team at all. He had grown so slight and frail that one day he was taken by some sophomores for a freshman, an incident which humiliated him terribly. He became known as something of a prodigy, a senior who was surely no more than sixteen, and he was often shocked at the worldliness of some of his classmates. His studies seemed harder to him. He felt that they were too advanced. He had heard his classmates speak of St. Midas's, the famous preparatory school, at which so many of them had prepared for college, and he determined after his graduation to enter himself at St. Midas's, where the sheltered life among boys his own size would be more congenial to him. Upon his graduation in 1914, he went home to Baltimore with his Harvard diploma in his pocket. Hildegard was now residing in Italy, so Benjamin went to live with his son, Roscoe. But though he was welcomed in a general way, there was obviously no heartiness in Roscoe's feeling toward him. There was even perceptible a tendency on his son's part to think that Benjamin, as he moped about the house in adolescent mooniness, was somewhat in the way. Roscoe was married now, and prominent in Baltimore life, and he wanted no scandal to creep out in connection with his family. Benjamin, no longer persona grata with the debutantes and younger college set, found himself left much alone, except for the companionship of three or four fifteen-year-old boys in the neighborhood. His idea of going to St. Midas's school recurred to him. Say, he said to Roscoe one day, I've told you over and over that I want to go to prep school. 
"'Well, go then,' replied Roscoe shortly. The matter was distasteful to him, and he wished to avoid a discussion. "'I can't go alone,' said Benjamin helplessly. "'You'll have to enter me and take me up there.' "'I haven't got time,' declared Roscoe abruptly. His eyes narrowed, and he looked uneasily at his father. "'As a matter of fact,' he added, "'you'd better not go on with this business much longer. you better pull up short. you better, you better—' He paused, and his face crimsoned as he sought for words. "'You better turn right around and start back the other way. This has gone too far to be a joke. It isn't funny any longer. You—you you behave yourself.' Benjamin looked at him on the verge of tears. "'And another thing,' continued Roscoe. "'When visitors are in the house, I want you to call me Uncle. Not Roscoe, but Uncle. Do you understand? It looks absurd for a boy of fifteen to call me by my first name.' Perhaps you'd better call me uncle all the time, so you'll get used to it. With a harsh look at his father, Roscoe turned away. Chapter 10 At the termination of this interview, Benjamin wandered dismally upstairs and stared at himself in the mirror. He had not shaved for three months, but he could find nothing on his face but a faint white down with which it seemed unnecessary to meddle. When he had first come home from Harvard, Roscoe had approached him with the proposition that he should wear eyeglasses and imitation whiskers glued to his cheeks, and it had seemed for a moment that the farce of his early years was to be repeated. But whiskers had itched and made him ashamed. He wept, and Roscoe had reluctantly relented. Benjamin opened a book of boys' stories, The Boy Scouts in Bimini Bay, and began to read. But he found himself thinking persistently about the war. America had joined the Allied cause during the preceding month, and Benjamin wanted to enlist. But, alas, sixteen was the minimum age, and he did not look that old. His true age, which was fifty-seven, would have disqualified him anyway. There was a knock at his door, and the butler appeared with a letter bearing a large official legend in the corner, and addressed to Mr. Benjamin Button. Benjamin tore it open eagerly, and read the enclosure with delight. It informed him that many reserve officers who had served in the Spanish-American War were being called back into service with a higher rank, and it enclosed his commission as Brigadier General in the United States Army, with orders to report immediately. Benjamin jumped to his feet, fairly quivering with enthusiasm. This was what he had wanted. He seized his cap, and ten minutes later he had entered a large tailoring establishment on Charles Street, and asked in his uncertain treble to be measured for a uniform. "'Want to play soldier, Sonny?' demanded a clerk, casually. Benjamin flushed. "'Say, never mind what I want,' he retorted angrily. "'My name's Button, and I live on Mount Vernon Place, so you know I'm good for it.' "'Well,' admitted the clerk, hesitantly, "'if you are not, I guess your daddy is all right.' Benjamin was measured, and a week later his uniform was completed. He had difficulty in obtaining the proper general's insignia, because the dealer kept insisting to Benjamin that a nice YWCA badge would look just as well and be much more fun to play with. Saying nothing to Roscoe, he left the house one night and proceeded by train to Camp Mosby in South Carolina, where he was to command an infantry brigade. On a sultry April day he approached the entrance to the camp, paid off the taxicab which had brought him from the station, and turned to the sentry on guard. "'Get someone to handle my luggage,' he said briskly. The sentry eyed him reproachfully. "'Say,' he remarked, "'where are you going with the general's dud, Sonny?' Benjamin, veteran of the Spanish-American War, whirled upon him with fire in his eye, but with, alas, a changing treble voice. "'Come to attention,' he tried to thunder. He paused for breath. Then suddenly he saw the sentry snap his heels together and bring his rifle to the present. Benjamin concealed a smile of gratification, but when he glanced around his smile faded. It was not he who had inspired obedience, but an imposing artillery colonel who was approaching on horseback. Colonel, called Benjamin shrilly. The colonel came up, drew rein, and looked coolly down at him with a twinkle in his eyes. "'Whose little boy are you?' he demanded, kindly. "'I'll soon darn well show you whose little boy I am,' retorted Benjamin in a ferocious voice. "'Get down off that horse!' 
The colonel roared with laughter. "'You want him, head general?' "'Here,' cried Benjamin desperately. "'Read this.' and he thrust his commission toward the colonel. The colonel read it, his eyes popping from their sockets. "'Where'd you get this?' he demanded, slipping the document into his own pocket. "'I got it from the government, as you'll soon find out.' "'You come along with me,' said the colonel, with a peculiar look. "'We'll go up to headquarters and talk this over. Come along.' The colonel turned and began walking his horse in the direction of headquarters. There was nothing for Benjamin to do but follow with as much dignity as possible, meanwhile promising himself a stern revenge. But this revenge did not materialize. Two days later, however, his son Roscoe materialized from Baltimore, hot and cross from a hasty trip, and escorted the weeping general, sans uniform, back to his home. Chapter 11 In 1920, Roscoe Button's first child was born. During the attendant festivities, however, no one thought it the thing to mention that the little grubby boy, apparently about ten years of age, who played around the house with lead soldiers and a miniature circus, was the new baby's own grandfather. No one disliked the little boy whose fresh, cheerful face was crossed with just a hint of sadness, but to Roscoe Button his presence was a source of torment. In the idiom of his generation, Roscoe did not consider the matter efficient, it seemed to him that his father, in refusing to look sixty, had not behaved like a red-blooded he-man, this was Roscoe's favorite expression, but in a curious and perverse manner. Indeed, to think about the matter for as much as half an hour drove him to the edge of insanity. Roscoe believed that live wires should keep young, but carrying it out on such a scale was, was, was inefficient, and there Roscoe rested. Five years later, Roscoe's little boy had grown old enough to play childish games with little Benjamin under the supervision of the same nurse. Roscoe took them both to kindergarten on the same day, and Benjamin found that playing with little strips of colored paper, making mats and chains and curious and beautiful designs, was the most fascinating game in the world. Once he was bad and had to stand in the corner. Then he cried but for the most part there were gay hours in the cheerful room, with the sunlight coming in the windows and Miss Bailey's kind hand resting for a moment now and then in his tousled hair. Roscoe's son moved up into the first grade after a year, but Benjamin stayed on in the kindergarten. He was very happy. Sometimes when other tots talked about what they would do when they grew up, a shadow would cross his little face, as if in a dim, childish way he realized that those were things in which he was never to share. The days flowed on in monotonous content. He went back a third year to the kindergarten, but he was too little now to understand what the bright, shining strips of paper were for. He cried because the other boys were bigger than he, and he was afraid of them. The teacher talked to him, but though he tried to understand, he could not understand at all. He was taken from the kindergarten. His nurse, Nana, in her starched gingham dress, became the center of his tiny world. On bright days they walked in the park. Nana would point at a great gray monster and say, Elephant, and Benjamin would say it after her. And when he was being undressed for bed that night, he would say it over and over aloud to her, Elephant, Elephant, Elephant. Sometimes Nana let him jump on the bed, which was fun, because if you sat down exactly right, it would bounce you up on your feet again, and if you said, ah, for a long time while you jumped, you got a very pleasing broken vocal effect. He loved to take a big cane from the hat rack and go around hitting chairs and tables with it and saying, fight, fight, fight. When there were people there, the old ladies would cluck at him, which interested him, and the young ladies would try to kiss him, which he submitted to with mild boredom. And when the long day was done at five o'clock, he would go upstairs with Nana and be fed oatmeal and nice, soft, mushy foods with a spoon. There were no troublesome memories in his childish sleep. No token came to him of his brave days at college, of the glittering years when he flustered the hearts of many girls. There were only the white, safe walls of his crib, and Nana, and a man who came to see him sometimes, and a great big orange ball that Nana pointed at just before his twilight bed hour and called Sun. When the sun went, his eyes were sleepy. There were no dreams, no dreams to haunt him. The past, the wild charge at the head of his men up San Juan Hill, 
the first years of his marriage when he worked late into the summer dusk down in the busy city for young Hildegard, whom he loved, the days before that when he sat smoking far into the night in the gloomy old button house on Monroe Street with his grandfather, all these had faded like unsubstantial dreams from his mind as though they had never been. He did not remember. He did not remember clearly whether the milk was warm or cool at his last feeding, or how the days passed. There was only his crib and Nana's familiar presence. And then he remembered nothing. When he was hungry, he cried. That was all. Through the noons and nights he breathed, and over him there were soft mumblings and murmurings that he scarcely heard, and faintly differentiated smells, and light and darkness. Then it was all dark, and his white crib and the dim faces that moved above him, and the warm, sweet aroma of the milk faded out altogether from his mind. End of The Curious Case of Benjamin Button by F. Scott Fitzgerald